Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. Today we're gonna do kind of like a botanical illustration of a Phasalis fruit. And I'm gonna start by drawing the husk and I'm making, I'm just gonna draw one and I'm making it really big, but I'm gonna link up to a, um, I think I've got some charcoal on my hands. I'm gonna link up to a reference photo on Pixabay, which has three. So if you like, if you wanna do all three, you wanna do them smaller and get more in, or you like a different, um, fruit shape better then you could do that but I'm just doing the one that is the closest to the viewer in the reference photo and I'm just starting off with the outside husk and I'm holding my mechanical pencil towards the end so I get kind of an organic um, jagged line and there's gonna be three kind of portions of husk here this video is brought to you by jerrysartorama.com. I will be using their um, Lucas watercolors today. You can, of course, use whatever you like. Now I'm gonna get the berry in the center, and I'm actually going to use my, my uh, white vinyl eraser just to erase some of that charcoal smudge I got there. I think, because I was um, using some pastels the other day and cleaning up my area, I think that I got some dust. I had to move my my mat that I usually have underneath because it had um, it had some of that uh, charcoal on it. When I went to clean it, I was getting charcoal everywhere. So I'm just going to get the berry in here. Can't really see the whole berry behind the husk. It really um, eclipses it. So I'm just going to put in what I can see. Although it is easier to draw a circle if you if you do kind of draw it and then erase what you don't need. And I like to use a white a vinyl eraser versus a um, kneaded eraser for watercolor paper just because it's a little bit more gentle. And then I'm going to get the stem underneath here, kind of coming straight down from the fruit. There's a little more lead there. Okay, now you can put some of the veining in here with your pencil. I wouldn't get too carried away with your uh, with your details with a pencil because we can go in with our paints, but uh, do whatever you're comfortable with. If you needed a pattern for this, I would suggest just um, you know downloading the reference photo and tracing it. That would probably be the uh, the most accurate way to get a pattern to trace. I didn't um, obviously doing this live, so I haven't stopped to scan it. Uh, and I really think that uh, kind of practicing drawing, even if you practice like on scrap paper and you don't like the way it comes out, you can always trace it later. In fact, um, I am drawing on my good paper, but because it's kind of organic, if something is not perfect, it's not gonna make that big of a difference. Um, but if you, you know, if you are nervous about drawing on your paper, draw on some scrap paper and transfer it once you've got all the problems figured out and that way you don't have to worry about damaging your fine art paper if you're a little nervous about it. But I also recommend getting doing some work in your sketchbook because that's going to, that's gonna help you become a more confident painter. Okay, once I've got the basic, just the basic lines, I don't need to have every little line in there. Once I have the basic veins, the basic structure, I'm just gonna go ahead and start doing some washes with my watercolor. Um, you can use whatever you have for brushes, really. I would suggest a couple rounds. Um, I really like the Creative Mark by Mimic. Those are downstairs at my uh, main painting table, but since it's chilly in the winter, I'm working upstairs. And for whatever reason, I haven't brought those pens up. And I am gonna start by doing a wash of color. Now I'm gonna try to find a color that's gonna, um, kind of incorporate everything and I'm gonna go with the yellow ochre. I find that's such a nice color. Um, it's so pleasant and it seems to work with so many different different colors here. And I also want something that's got a little bit of a, of a tint of green to it. Um, and I think I'm going to go with, um, I could go with the green gold, which is, you can see this, it's just like kind of a, a very, very vibrant kind of greenish yellow. You see them next to each other on my palette. I'm also gonna want some brown. And I think I'm gonna go with, let's see, I've got, what I do is I, I make a chart of all my colors and that way, because sometimes in the pans they look so dark, it can be tough to see what you actually have. And I think that I'm gonna go with this one here called 
Um, it's right next to Burnt Umber, but oh, I can hardly read my... I think it's actually called Burnt Green. Um, it's right next to Burnt Umber in the palette here. I'm going to start off with these colors. And if it helps, if you have a big set like this, you can take the pans out and put them in a smaller palette or just set them on a plate uh, so you're not confused as you're working. I know I'm going to need a red um, or an orange or something like that in this. And I think I'm actually, since this is not a hugely dramatic scene, I think I am going to go with a permanent yellow deep. And I'm also going to want to have a blue just in case I need to tint or darken things. So I'm going to go with um, ultramarine blue. And uh, I feel like I probably should add a red to this. So I think, um, I'm not sure how much I'll use it, but I think I will go in with a, um, I think I'll use Lucas Red, which is... Um, uh, fairly neutral red, right? almost looks like a naphthol red. So we got so we got some good primaries there. They're all warm colors, so we're not going to have really vibrant colors, but that's all right because what we're painting is is pretty muted. Uh, I'm going to begin by using a juicier brush and wetting my background here. And I'm actually going to go ahead and wet the whole thing that is, I'm going to leave the background, like the background of the picture white. I'm going to go ahead and wet, wet everything that is going to be painted. And this is going to be um, a unifying wash. Feel free to adjust the speed. If this is too slow for you, you can click the gear on the YouTube player and you can, um, you can watch this at a faster speed. If you want to find any of the supplies that I'm using today, you can find them linked in the video description. And I'll also have a coupon code linked up for Jerry's Artorama. But of course, as always, if you have supplies, use what you have. So we've got a warm yellow, we've got a warm red, we've got a warm blue, we've got a uh, neutral brown, we've got a green, and we've got a yellow ochre. This is kind of like a... Uh, a brighter green. So I'm just going to look at this and make sure that I did in fact wet all the area. I'm working on hot press watercolor paper. You can, you don't have to, you can work on cold press if you prefer. I just think sometimes this is nice to use when you're doing a botanical or you're doing a portrait, but uh, it's completely up to you what you want to use. I did go outside of the line there um, and I'm just going to blot that. So, and if some paint does flow outside, or if I get a rough edge here, I'm not going to worry about it, but uh, I'm going to just dry it since I see that it's there and I didn't want it there. All right, so what do I want to paint with? I'm really feeling like this is a number six. It's a little too small. I like to use something a little bit bigger than that. You'll go with like a number eight. Use whatever size you're comfortable with, honestly. I feel like all my favorite painting brushes are downstairs. <laughs> That's all right, I'll use a number six, that'll be fine. I'm gonna start off with my yellow ochre. And sometimes it's helpful to prop up your uh, painting as you're going. Since we've pre-wet the surface, we'll get a nice smooth uh, application. I'm gonna grab some of the green gold here and add it in towards the edge. And I'm going to grab some of that green gold and add it in here too. And I'm going to grab some of the brown with the yellow ochre and add that towards the bottom here. Hot press paper will be more likely to puddle and give you blooms if you're not careful, so just kind of mind the puddles. You can take a brush that's dry, a really like absorbent brush that's dry and you can set it in there to sop up any, like if you have too much water. It just kind of drinks it up. Hot press paper, the, the paint will tend to run on you. Now keep in mind that this is going to dry a little bit lighter because you're working on such a wet surface. I've got the green here. I'm just looking at my reference photo and saying, okay, where do I, what undertones do I see in these colors? And this is just going to allow me to get a little bit more done in this first wash than I would otherwise if I just 
did a wash of yellow ochre, and then I went in with a wash of these other colors. I think I'm going to go ahead and actually just paint with my brush that I wet with, just because it's... Um, I don't like to mess around with small brushes. I like to use a larger brush. I like to get, especially at the beginning stages, I like to get more done. Now I like to also grab a little bit of, um, if I know I've got other colors that I'm going to be using, I like to grab a little bit of those while I am doing these, this first wash because I like to get everything incorporated. That gives us a better sense of unity when we're working. And you can keep going back in as long as your paper's still wet, it hasn't started to dry, you can go back in and you can alter these, um, these, sh these colors, these areas, and you can get these really subtle bits of, uh, of coloring in. It's going to look a lot more natural if you get that in on the first wash than if you let it all, um, then if you let it dry and you glaze over, I mean, you will, we will do some glazing in here, but it's just, it's just a little easier, uh, time saving and a little more natural looking if you can do some of this in the first, the first go. Uh, now in the center, I think I will go back to the other brush just cause I don't want it to be so thirsty. We're going to go to that, uh, permanent yellow deep color that we are using, which I think was right here. Yes, that's it. And I'm going to go ahead and paint this in. I want to leave a little bit of a highlight. I want it to be kind of soft, so I'm not going to go in and lift. I'm just going to leave that like that. And I'm going to grab some of that brown. So this is the brown we used. A little more of that yellow. A little bit of the red, and I'm going to go ahead and add that towards the bottom of this berry just to give it a little bit of um, a little bit of shadow, a little bit of depth and roundness right on the edges. Okay, now for the stem, I'm going to take the brown and the ultramarine blue. You can use burnt umber, Van Dyke brown, any uh, any neutral brown that's not too red. I wouldn't use the burnt sienna unless it, your burnt sienna definitely looks more like a burnt umber, just because that will be a little bit too, too dark, I think. I'm going to add a little bit of red in that shadow, though. And I see a puddle, so I'm just going to dry my brush off. This is just a Taclon brush here, um, Golden Taclon. It's not terribly thirsty, but I knew it, I, it had enough um, absorbency to pick up that puddle. Okay, now before I do a, the cast shadow underneath it, I have to let this dry. So um, I'm just going to double check for any puddles, let this dry, and we will come back when that's dry to add on our next layer. Now that this is dry, the next thing we need to do is the shadow under the berry here. And there's two ways you can do it. You can either wet the area you want the shadow to go in, or you can put in the color and then you can fade it out. Uh, it's it's up to you which way you want to do it. I think maybe wetting the area might be a little bit easier, but you have a little more control if you put the color in and you fade it out. And that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to start off, oops, I grabbed the wrong brown again. I'm going to start off, I just, and it doesn't really matter which one you use, just keep it consistent throughout the painting. I'm going to grab the brown. I'm going to grab some of the ultramarine. So it's a little bit darker in some areas. And I will pull in some yellow. I'll actually pull in some of each of these colors too into the shadow on the edges. And that's just going to give it um, that little bit of natural glow. So it really, so, you, so you're seeing some shadow, but you're also seeing these um, these leaves where they're so papery, the light goes through them and it will actually alter, like will shine through and kind of like a stained glass window, leave some color there. So I'm gonna start off by grabbing the darker color here, the blue and brown mix, and that's gonna go right up next to the, um, the fruit here and right next to the stem, it's actually going right over the stem. And I'm going to bring it out. 
add in some of these other colors because the berry is is opaque is more opaque and it's giving um, it's going to give off a little bit more color there you can actually have a little bit of red in towards the shadow there clean my brush I'm gonna add a little bit of the yellow here towards the edge where I'm gonna be fading it out more over here and it's going to fade back this way a little bit more I've got a couple light sources here most of the shadow is underneath oh this reminds me though something about hot press paper is that um, it is tough uh, more difficult to fade out a shadow on the hot press paper because the colors do tend to want to stay put. So now, whoops, you want to clean your brush, you want to wet it, you want to wet it, clean it, blot it, and then just kind of soften the edges. Uh, if you want more dark, I would just go in and do it while it's still wet. And then just kind of blot your brush and just fade it into the paint that's still wet. You don't want to have any hard edges if you can avoid it. So I'm just not really adding much water to my brush. I'm just feathering it out with the tip of my brush. I do want to have some distinct shadows from each of the petals here, each of the husks. Kind of gently fade it out. And I might do a little bit more after it dries. I might go in with another layer of shadow, but for right now, I just want to get that tone in there. The key is not to have your brush wetter than your paper, and that's going to avoid the back runs. It's okay if there's a little texture in your shadow because um, you'll have texture in the leaves as well. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of the, and you can switch to a smaller brush if you need to. I'm going to take some of the brown. I'm going to take some of the green, that green gold color, a little bit of the blue. And uh, switch to a smaller brush if you need to. I'm going to be doing the larger veins here, like the ones we sketched on. And I'm going to be working my brush straight up and down. I can tip it a little bit so that hopefully you'll be able to see where the brush hits the paper. And this is a number six, so it's not like really small, but um, but you can still get a really nice, really nice edge on it. I like to have the option to go to a smaller brush for those finer, finer veins. And plus this develops brush control. And just try to um, be patient and focus as you're doing those veins. Feel free to turn your paper around if you need to. And it's okay if you skip, like if you have little gaps in your lines. That will look that will look way more natural. I find that it's easier to pull a uh, line towards me. This one should be a little bit lighter. Oh, look at that! I can really see the green when I. Add that yellow ochre. I'm going to make this one over here a little bit lighter. Sometimes you can erase your pencil marks when you're done um, just by erasing over on top of your design. I often leave them in because I kind of like them, but I don't draw terribly dark. I probably draw a little bit darker when I'm doing a tutorial than I typically would just because I want it to show on camera. And sometimes pencil marks on white paper just get kind of blown out. All right, those are the main veins, I think, from what I can see in the reference photo. 
So now I am going to switch to a smaller brush. So I have that option to go down another another size. This is a number two. So I went from a number six to a number two. This is a synthetic. So I'm going to have to probably reload a little more frequently than I would if I had a um, like a mimic or a fur brush. Um, these veins are going to be lighter. So I'm going to need more of the yellow ochre brown in that green color. I can put a little bit of red in there too. Just want it to be lighter here. And that the nice thing about you know doing these lighter ones is that um, if you make a mistake, it's really not you know, it's not going to show up that much. It's just going to kind of show up this texture. So I'm going in and throwing these lighter ones tend to go in between the darker ones and then these veins. I'll, I'll look for a really strong vein and then I'll work out from that. And I'll do these secondary kind of sizes here. Uh, that way, if I started going into some tiny little detail instead of kind of working out like this, then I might realize that, well, I just spent an hour doing like a square centimeter of space and I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that for everything. <laughs> so by working um, kind of broad and then going down to your more finer details, you can kind of decide if you want to omit any of those details. And I think that's really nice because you may just tire of it and you've learned what you wanted to learn from this particular lesson, but then you've got, you've got to, if you don't do any more, it's not going to be finished. But if you have it all to a certain level of doneness, then you could call it finished. And over here, I've got another little kind of tiny vein like that. And we got some more little stems kind of coming off. So you've got almost like this texture. It almost looks like um, chicken wire. It's, it's like a, um, like a grid or a mesh, like a kind of like a skeleton leaf. And you don't really see many of the cells over here. So I'm just putting it in like that. So we'll do that for these others. I think I want a little more green. So I'm going to do a little bit more of that green gold, a little bit of the blue. So I have more of like a, a greenish tint to these. And I'm going to do these veins here. They seem to be a little bit more freeform or organic looking back here. So I am, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm drawing what I see, not what I think it should be because how that is, I'm looking at it and I am getting those patterns in as I see them. Now, you know, if you were tracing the photo, you could blow it up and you could, you could pencil trace every one of these lines. Um, that's up to you. If that makes you feel better about this if, if you prefer to do it that way then by all means do it um, but I don't think you need every single detail in here to make it look to make it look good or or finished now here I almost see kind of like a um, almost looks kind of honeycombish like the center vein is kind of zigzagging and I think it's just because you're seeing the different offshoots of veins being caught by the light but I'm gonna put in the line that I see the clearest and then I'll bring the little offshoots from that. And the reason I like to do these veinings at this stage rather than kind of waiting and um, and doing them at the end is because we'll put glazes over here and there and when you glaze over you soften some of these and by softening them it does make them look a little bit more realistic. I don't see too many veins back there. If you want to go in, you really, this one's kind of blurry, so I don't really see much there. Um, if you want to go in and add some finer veins, you can do that. I might just do the, uh, the green gold kind of on its own for that. Uh, but I don't really feel like I want too many of those tiny little veins in. I would just kind of like, just do some like kind of criss, criss, um, crisscross scribbly marks. Because I think by the time we glaze, we're going to lose a lot of intricacy. And that's, you know, that's my style of painting. If you want something that's a little more detailed and botanical, then you do what you want to do. It, it also depends on how long do you want to spend on this. If you want to spend um, eight hours on it, then go ahead, um, tackle each little section with precision and... Um, 
and go about it that way. Nobody would watch a video that was that long <laughs> that was doing that. So, uh, so I'm not going to do that. But that might be kind of fun to do, like on my in free time. I probably wouldn't attempt that unless I actually had the fruit. If I wasn't working for a photo, if I actually had the plant, because then I could really like use a magnifier, get in close, and um, look at it from all angles. But that's just me. You can do whatever you like. Um, so for this flower here, uh, this uh, the berry in the center, I'm going to take some of the color. I'm going to use the permanent yellow deep, mix it into some of that red. And I'm going to add some of that down here, and I'm just going to kind of build up some body here. Still using that number two. I'm going to take a clean, dry brush, just have that handy for when I want to blend. Keep that, keep a wet edge. I'm just going to build up the color a little bit. And then I can take the damp brush and I can just fade it a little bit. And I can do that over. I think I want a little bit of that brown and blue mix in here too. Add some of this over here. Clean my brush, pick up a little bit more of the yellow. You do have to work a little quickly on this technique because on the hot press paper it does want to, uh, it can want to stain a little bit. But again, we can always do a glaze of the yellow, the permanent yellow deep on top to deepen that if we need to. Okay, now the uh, the veins are going to dry really quick, which is nice. And you just want to make sure that you have a really soft brush for what you're going to do next. I'm just using this. Um, doesn't really matter. You can use a round or or a filbert. This is called a cat's tongue, which is like a filbert shaped brush. It's by Princeton. It's number six. Um, I and mine is really soft because I've had it for quite a while. Any soft uh, any soft round is going to be fine though. So I'm just going to take. Um, I'm going to look at my reference and I'm going to say, okay, I see like a, a, a chunk of this color up here and I am just going to go glaze it on. See that color is nice and transparent so I can see what's underneath there really well. And I see another chunk of it over here. All right, I'm going to, I see some of that brown even a little bit of red in it. And I'm going to add that. Now since this brush is soft, it's going to um, it's going to prevent like lifting up the underneath stuff too much. Get some of that under here. And by kind of patting it in too, I can kind of get that wrinkly texture. A little bit of that up here. It just helps you build those folds and those dimensions. Now I've got a little bit that's got a little more red into it, but it's starting off with a brown. A little bit of the red. Let's see, we use Lucas Red, so we'll put a little of that in there. And I'm seeing some of that. Um, seeing some of that next to this line there. And the other thing I do like about this cat's tongue shape is that I can twist it and I can get um, I can get different widths on my brush. So I can get a fine line, I can get a thinner line just by twisting the brush. And you can kind of dry brush it on there and, and pat it on, and that's going to give you that cellular texture. And if you get too much on there, you can blot it. Uh, I'm going to take some more of that green. 
and I'm going to add that to a few spots here where I see it. And these are very subtle. If you don't see the color, don't um, don't worry. It's more of like it's not very obvious. You're more seeing color undertones, so kind of keep that in mind. Don't be um, don't be discouraged if you're not seeing all of those colors. Let me get some of that uh, that yellow we used for the center as well. I see some of that and that's probably kind of almost reflective and um, my paper's drying really fast so if you feel like things aren't drying quick enough and, and things want to feather then of course you can give it a little more time so now I think I do want to do a glaze of that yellow right on top of the uh, the berry. I'm going to try to avoid the highlight as much as I can, and I'm going to do a controlled wash. I'm going to start. Um, I'm going to start up here. I'm going on the dry paper. I'm going to work around the highlight. I didn't do the bead on this controlled wash just because I don't really need. That much paint to get into this area. I'll clean off my brush and blot it and then I'm just going to soften it around the highlight area. And I can lift out if I if I need it brighter. Okay, so I'm looking at the shadow under there and I'm thinking that um, I want to soften it a little bit. So what I'm going to do is actually re-wet the shadow. And I'm going to drop in some colors. I've got a nice foundation of the colors already. So if I wet it and then drop in some colors, I can deepen it, but I've still got those kind of distinct one to three husk shadow areas. I want to get um, some color with some blue, more blue in it towards the center. And that's going to help the, um, the vibrancy of the center of the plant. And I can bring a little, gently bring a little bit of that towards the, uh, towards the outside. And get some more of the green in there. And some of the yellow. Some of the red. It's a, kind of surprising we use so many colors where it's such a muted piece, but you know, we neutralize them so they would harmonize and they would look all right. Often our shadows have red at the edges, and we don't really notice that. And I usually find that I need to go deeper than I think with a color. And especially when it shifts and it dries, and that should be real dark in there. So I'm just going in right into that wet paint and adding that color right now. And then I can also define the bottom of my, um, of my plant. I think I had the stem too long, honestly, in my sketch. Sometimes I'll just kind of tap it to help it uh, help it move a little bit. And sometimes I just use the brush very gently to help bring it out. Um, this color is pretty strong, so I'm going to grab this other brush. 
which is a little damp. And I can use that to help it travel where I want it to travel. All right, that's okay. After it's all dry, I might brush some water over that and add in kind of like a toning color, maybe even some watered down blue to make everything kind of pop a little bit, but um, I don't want to decide on that quite yet. So now I want to have um, a little bit of depth here. I'm gonna see if the center's still a little damp there, so I can't really mess with that. I'm gonna go in with this dark color that I used in the shadow, and I'm actually going to add it to some portions of the husk. I'm gonna add some, I'm actually gonna turn this around because I don't want to set my hand in the, in the wet paint. I'm going to add it up here to the edge, into some of the veins. Now the key is not to outline. Um, you just want to kind of enhance here and there where you see that you have some, uh, maybe you have some veins and you're seeing the the husk folded over a little bit so you're just seeing like a couple layers of plant and it's just making it look a little dark. and it kind of looks dried out. And that texture is really helpful. Like this whole edge appears to be quite a bit darker than, um, than the rest of the plant because it's folded right on a vein. And I want to bring up a little bit of shadow from the bottom of this too. Especially right in here. Okay, and then we also have a dark vein going right there. I'm trying not to add too much water to my paint so I can keep it kind of concentrated. And I also want to get some dark in there, right underneath the berry. That could be a little bit darker. I feel like I would like a little more definition here. Um, they do kind of blend together in the reference photo, but since you're the artist, you can change things. If you don't like it, if you want to add um, a little definition if you want to do something else you can because it's your picture so that's what I'm going to do here I'm going to try to carve out this detail a little bit by kind of adding a little bit of detail on the cells here and the uh, the veins and whatnot in the husk in front And then maybe a little shadow back there. Let's grab a little blue, add it to that mix. There we go. That kind of makes it a little plum. A little more blue. We'll add that greenish color in there too. There we go. And we'll add that back here. Along the edge. Maybe a little bit in there. actually darken that back there and that would help it stand out. Let's get a little more blue in there to cool it down. So I'm going a little more dramatic than the photo, but um, but I feel like it's a little more interesting and it's helping the composition. So your choice, you're painting your choice. Now that is kind of fuzzy in the reference photo and I'm inclined to leave it that way. I do feel like I need maybe a little bit of some shaded areas over here to make it um, 
to make it jive. And I'm also kind of feeling like I do want a little bit of color in the background, even though I intended on keeping it white. So feel free to keep it white if you want to. Um, I'm going to see what I can mix up with the colors I have. Um, and I'm going for kind of like a teal color. It would be pretty just to grab that cobalt teal right there, but I want to stick with colors I've used. So I'm going to try ultramarine blue and this green color. See what I get there. It's going to be pretty limited. But it might work. Maybe add a little bit of that yellow to it. Let's see what happens. That's a pretty warm yellow, so... That's not too bad. It's kind of nice. Alright, so I just feel like I want a little something else in here. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just kind of wet over the shadow area. Actually, I probably should wet the whole background and then I'll just let the, the paint fade where it wants to fade. Try not to wet... Um, Make sure your water is nice and clear. Try not to get water onto the flower itself. I mean, the, the fruit itself. Be quite precise with this if you can. And of course, this is optional. I just was feeling like I needed something. add that in there and see what it does. But I'm only adding it at the bottom and only a little amount because um, in case this was a horrible idea, I don't want to ruin the painting. <laughs> I'm tipping it just to let it flow. And I'm just making sure that it's flowing evenly. And once you're happy with the amount of flow that you have, then just, um, I would turn your paper back around so it doesn't keep creeping. And just look for any puddles, because if you have any puddles, they are liable to go kind of um, kind of blossomy on you. Also, if you want to adjust your shadow under the plant, this is a great time to do it. I actually don't know if I really need to. Yeah, I think my shadow's probably fine. Yeah. I also really like the blue, so you'll go ahead and add some more of that in there. I feel like when you have that, when you have such an orange dominant uh, thing, having that uh, subject, having some blue in there really helps. Okay, so now I think I'm just going to let this dry. I think that, um, that this painting is done. I will add in a photo of the finished painting so you can see it here on screen. If you want to see any of the products that I use, you can find them at our sponsor, jerrysartorama.com. I'll have links in the video description for you to click and check in, out any of these as well as a coupon code. Thanks so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up before you go. Until next time, happy crafting.